So here I am sitting in a garden in Saarbrücken in Germany, just next to the French border, and I'm sitting with Nassim Haramin from Hawaii, here am I from England, and we meet in the bottom left-hand corner of Germany, almost in France. And Nassim is one of the world's top theoretical physicists, and he showed us something yesterday which is not yet published, so I'm not going to tell you what it is. Um, but has solved one of the fundamental problems in physics and if just desserts are given it, it will get a Nobel Prize. It's that sort of significant. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and <clears throat> what I want to, well what you portrayed yesterday was something which is very very interesting that physics, and in fact science as a whole, has been concerning itself with a tiny, tiny fraction of 1% of everything in the universe. Mm -hmm. And what you showed to us yesterday was that 99.99% of the universe is space. But it's not empty, is it? Well, that's the thing, and uh, you know, that's what I'm excited about, these equations, and I'm really doing this not for prices, but, you know, for evolution and, and for humanity as a whole, but is that this, the vacuum of what we call space is not empty at all, and we've known that for almost a hundred years in quantum theory, but it was never really applied uh, to the physical world, the classical world, of the world we experience every day and I think that was an error that that needed to be um, understood and that this energy in the vacuum is not um, just a result but actually is the source of the material world it's 99.99999 percent of everything that's I mean that's how much vacuum there is in an atom and so that the material world, we start to understand that the material world is actually like the point zero 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 one of a percent is actually just an effect of the structure of the vacuum itself so that it's no longer uh, matter defining space but it's actually space that defines matter. So life isn't just a, f a little bit of fleck upon some piece of matter. Life is the entire universe expressing itself occasionally through little pieces of matter. That's right. It's like, it, it really is like um, a deeper understanding of the source of ma the material world, that, that it's actually a function of a field that is much um, larger than the field that we can measure around an object, that it's a field that everything is bathing in and uh, feeding from, and, and feeding information back into that there is this dynamical relationship between everything and this field. It reminds me somewhat of something which happened to me when I was about 12 when I got my first astrophysics book in my hand. I got this picture from just looking at it of the universe as a sort of rubber sheet if you like mm -hmm that when something causes the, the rubber sheet to be depressed, it then creates matter. Mm -hmm. That's right. And when, yeah, that's very good. I mean, that's a good idea. And it's very similar to what Einstein visualized when he um, wrote General Relativity. He was describing space and time like a like a sheet, uh, like a, the surface of a trampoline that you would put a mass on it and it would bend the surface, it would bend the trampoline so that it would create space-time curvature as we call it and another mass put on that sheet, put on that trampoline would tend to uh, gravitate towards the first mass because, uh, because the space-time manifold, the structure of space-time is curved around the mass and, um, and that's uh, very similar to what you just described um, but the thing is is that if you don't describe where mass comes from, where, ma where it originates from then you are describing gravity 
uh, based on mass, but you're not saying what mass is. And this is where I think we're getting to with some of the equations I'm writing, is that mass is a function of the structure of, of the vacuum itself, meaning that it's not something, but it's actually a result of space-time curling into these little vortices that um, create depressions, you know, just like water going down the drain. Mm -hmm. So that the, the when the spiral is created as it's going down the drain, you see the water is curving, and mm -hmm. that's what's producing the curvature in space-time. So it's a deeper level of understanding of what mass is. That, is related dr directly to this energy of the vacuum spinning in that region of space, producing a gravitational field. So it's rather like an eddy in a stream or a Schauberger vortex. Now, I know I'm springing this on you because you've not had a chance to see it yet, but some of the experiments we've been doing with the Harmony Omega, and which greatly enhances human intention, I've been able to create Schauberger vortex in city water. And so the water actually cleans itself. Oh, that's so very you're actually using a vortex to change the structure of matter. Right, and and you know I think that many experiments need to be done um, using uh, concepts that Schalberger and Walter Russell and Tesla brought forward. That like the vorticular dynamics of space-time itself. Um, can be, uh, you know, altered and, and, and worked with to reproduce natural uh, phenomena that, nat that you see in nature everywhere, but that you can reproduce in laboratory to uh, create energy, extract energy directly out of space-time, or create gravitational fields, because if, if um, space-time curves because there's eddies in it, hmm. then you know, it's a straight engineering uh, uh, path to understanding how to create gravity by producing eddies in space-time and so on. So there is very powerful possibilities that emerge from this new view, this view that this field we're baiting in has very specific geometric and mechanical dynamics that we can understand that has to do with spin and vorticity and fluid dynamics and then when we understand that our world is going to completely change. So correct me if I'm wrong but um, up till now in order to create electric energy for example we've been concerning ourselves with a tiny fraction of one percent of tiny fraction of one percent of tiny fraction of one t ever so many tinies of one percent of matter using tremendous effort to create a little bit of electricity right. at an enormous cost, right. not only in cash terms but in environmental terms, when really we've been sitting bathing in unlimited electrical power all the time and we've just been not put the plug in. That's right. We need to log on to the universal net, you know, and in the universal net when you look at the result of it, when you look at the universe, it, we don't live in a universe which lacks energy. Mm -hmm. You know, the sun is burning continuously for millions, billions of years. Uh, you know, galaxies, stars, like black holes, like huge energy events everywhere we look in the universe. Even the, uh, you know, uh, a hurricane with all its electrical discharges and ionization and so on. Nature is an extremely energetic system, and so you, you got to look at the base. Where does it ext extract its energy from, and how? And when you start to uh, understand these principles, then you can reproduce the same principle that nature uses uh, to extract energy from this field that we're mm -hmm. all interacting in, that connects us all. And then you become harmonious with nature because you, your technology is using the same principle that everything in the natural world uses. So uh, most likely it's going to have a very, very low environment, negative environmental impact. It's probably going to have a very positive uh, um, life-enhancing impact on, on plants and animals and people around it. 
so that all of a sudden you are going in your your society instead of using the entropic side of the universe the the part of the universe that's radiating and that's going towards further in disorder is starting to tap into the neg entropic side the or order side of the universe the the part that creates coherency instead of the part that creates incoherency and so the energy potential is m orders of magnitude greater absolutely it's the the numbers are staggering when you do the mathematics like if if we were to extract one billionth of a billionth of a billion percent of the energy available in a cubic um, uh, inch of uh, energy from the vacuum which is extremely high it's it's measured in quantum uh, physics and, uh, in laboratory and um, you know and we were to uh, extract that we we would have enough power to run the whole planet and you know it, for thousands and thousands of years out of a centimeter cube of space so it's really an incredible potential it's really a step that humanity must make at this time and I think it's a step that most civilization in the universe must have made in their evolution at one time or another so that they would become uh, self-sustaining and you know um, even thriving and and even become uh, societies that have a larger um, capacity than just the surface of their planet so that they could travel in their solar system they could travel in the galaxy and even inside the, in the universe and because there is very very important application of this to space travel mm -hmm. so correct just to make sure we've got this right you're not talking about nuclear power you're talking about a source of power which is environmentally zero right it's the power at the source of nuclear power is just there's a power before nuclei occurs, before matter occurs. It's a source of creation, not using the energy after creation, but using the energy before creation, the source of the material world, which is a, a well of energy that's in, almost infinite in, in nature. In quantum theory, it's calculated at 10 to the 90 three grams per centimeter cube which is an extraordinary number 10 with 93 zeros is an extremely huge number inside a centimeter cube of space that's pretty good numbers but does that imply that we have to make some changes to ourselves i mean <clears throat> we have our planet right now which is controlled by greed and not by humanity mm -hmm. not by human ethic values do, do we not have to make enormous steps in that direction as well otherwise we're going to burn our fingers right I think that's coming along at the same time I, uh, you know as we're I was as we're discovering more and more of this and we're understanding deeper and deeper the physics of nature and, and these equations that I was showing yesterday that pretty well proves that um, you know all protons all atoms are connected to all other atoms in the universe we're starting to realize that you know um, we're all connected we're starting to experience ourselves as the as a one system as as a unity system instead of separated and in, and individualized and uh, as we do this I think we're, our ethics are gonna change as we realize that we're all connected as these physics come along and they help us understand why we're all connected meaning that the space between you and I is not empty and all the atoms that makes up you and all the atoms that makes up me are connected through these little wormholes uh, that connects all things in the universe through this vacuum fluctuations